This is Origin Stories, the Leaky Foundation podcast. I'm Meredith Johnson. A few years ago, I heard a talk called Relatives and Ancestors by Bernard Wood. It was so interesting and funny, I got curious to learn more about him and his work. Wood is a medically trained paleoanthropologist and university professor of human origins at the George Washington University. He's one of the people other scientists turn to when they found a new fossil, and they need to figure out how it might be related to us. That's because one of his academic specialties is reconstructing phylogeny, figuring out the relationships between living things. He's spent decades working on understanding the connections between us and everything else in the primate family tree. So when some of you asked for sort of a refresher course in human evolution, it felt like the perfect chance to talk to him. Human evolution, okay, human evolution in five minutes. I think you could argue that one of the most important pieces of evidence about human evolution which has emerged in the last quarter of a century has absolutely nothing to do with fossils. It's, it's to do with the fact that molecular biologists have now come up with really convincing evidence that the apes that are most closely related to modern humans are chimpanzees and bonobos. That, I think, is really very secure. We share nearly 99% of our DNA with chimps and bonobos, which means we clearly share a common ancestor with them. Wood says most estimates are that our common ancestor lived 5 to 7 million years ago. Human evolution is what occurred between that hypothetical common ancestor of modern humans and chimpanzees and bonobos and the present. And so if I get asked at a, at a party, what do I do? That's what I say. I'm interested in what happens between that hypothetical common ancestor and modern humans. So if you want to plot out what happened in human evolution and understand the relationships between all the creatures that ever lived, One way is by looking at what we call the tree of life. If you think of the tree of life, if you think of a sort of three-dimensional tree, uh, which, which was Darwin's, one of his major contributions, was suggesting that all living creatures were related like the branches on a tree. It's a really elegant image that Charles Darwin first sketched out in the mid 1800s. The idea that all life is genetically connected like branches in a tree reaching back to a common root is a really wonderful metaphor. So imagine a tree. Everything alive today is on the surface of the tree, like leaves at the tips of the branches. The, the surface of the tree contains all living organisms. And the branches within the tree are either leading to those living organisms, because every living organism can trace itself back to the base of the tree, or they represent organisms which are extinct because they didn't make it onto the surface of the tree. Modern humans made it onto the surface of the tree and chimpanzees and bonobos did and lowland and mountain gorillas and orangutans from Borneo and and Sumatra. But the common ancestor we share didn't make it. Now the logic is that the only branches that you have to have in the tree are the ones that lead to the surface because every animal alive today has to have ancestors. Wood says you could argue that the only thing you're going to find in the fossil record is a series of ancestors, going from us at the tip of the branch, back and back, getting more and more primitive as we get closer to the base of the branch. Maybe Neanderthals were our ancestors, and then Homo erectus was the ancestor of Neanderthals and Australopithecus of Homo erectus and some more primitive form of Australopithecus and so on and so forth until you get back to the hypothetical common ancestor. But if you look at the rest of the animal kingdom, at their branches in the tree, you'll see that the branches that don't lead to living creatures vastly outnumber the ones that do. So you could say, well, in that's the, if that's the case, and why should our part of the tree of life be any different than the rest of the tree of life. You could argue that instead of assuming that every fossil creature you find is an ancestor, you could argue it's a close relative and not an ancestor. So not every hominid fossil we find in the ground was necessarily one of our precursors. And when I give talks about this, I show two pictures. 
One is a picture of his great-grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary. And my father is in the picture, his mother is in the picture, his father is in the picture, his grandparents are in the picture. And there's only one person in the picture who's not one of my ancestors, and it's my Aunt Kitty. Okay. And she was a lovely person, but she was not necessary for my existence. She was a necessary for her descendants' existence, but she wasn't necessary for my existence. So that's an example where ancestors outnumber close relatives who are not ancestors, so non-ancestral close relatives. I also show a picture of my christening. The close relatives, they outnumber the ancestors. And the question is, is our evolutionary history more like the golden wedding picture or is it more like the christening picture? My sense is that it's rather more like the christening picture. In other words, I think there are certainly from four million years until 50,000 years ago, or maybe even more recently, there was always evidence of more than one lineage. You only need one lineage to connect us back to the, the common ancestor of us and chimpanzees and bonobos. Um, but, it, but at almost every stage we looked at, there is evidence, I think there is pretty good evidence for more than one lineage. So Bernard Wood says you can either think of our evolutionary history like a ladder with a series of ancestors and descendants leading to modern humans, or you can imagine that it's more like a bush, more like a fruit bush. A black currant bush or a red currant bush or some other currant bush. With lots of branches leading up to the surface, but ours is the only branch that actually made it. Figuring out how all these branches on the phylogenetic tree of life should connect is tricky business. And we're finding lots of possible new relatives all the time. The fossil record shows that even pretty recently, there were several kinds of humans living at the same time. If you look back, say just 50,000 years ago, you'd see several kinds of creatures that are clearly our relatives. There were modern humans, there were Neanderthals, there were probably late surviving Homo erectus. There was um, the Denisovans, which is just known from a few fossils from a cave in mainland Asia in, in Russia. The molecular biologists say that there is a ghost lineage as well, so there's probably another lineage for which we don't have any fossils. And there is Homo floresiensis. And so it's not that long ago there would be more than one living representative of the hominin clade. Um, so the fact that there's only one now slightly misleads us about how how busy and complex was our evolutionary history. I asked Wood exactly how paleoanthropologists figure out which of these fossil relatives might be our ancestors. He said they usually start by comparing the morphology, the form and structure of an organism. You do this by, by making the assumption that the more morphology two species share, the more closely related they are which is a perfectly reasonable, you know, I mean, it's a perfectly reasonable principle. The only problem is that evolution is sort of lazy. The same things, if they do a good job for one animal, are likely to do a good job for another animal. So the same solution to an environmental challenge or a food source opportunity might evolve in different contexts. And so that means that Shared morphology does not always mean shared recent evolutionary history. It might mean shared environments and a shared evolutionary response, adaptive response to those environments. And so, you know, for example, you could assume that, that every early hominin that has large chewing teeth inherited those large chewing teeth from, from a recent common ancestor. My instinct is that large chewing teeth have evolved several times in the course of human evolution, of hominin evolution. Color vision is another example. Most, if not all, primates have some form of color vision. You would have thought that, that having a system in your eye that allowed you to distinguish color was such a complex change in your retina that it's, it's racingly unlikely that this would have occurred more than once. 
I don't know the literature, but I, my memory is that there is molecular evidence that, uh, that color vision has probably evolved independently three or four times in the primate clade. Wood says he thinks adaptations like large chewing teeth and upright walking may have evolved multiple times over the course of evolution in hominins that aren't each other's ancestors. This makes his work of figuring out who's a relative and who's an ancestor and drawing the lines on our family tree pretty challenging, to say the least. There have to be lines. Okay. Um, you know, there has to be a natural phylogeny. And so I have to try and think of ways that one can try and get round the problem of shared morphology, not meaning shared recent evolutionary history. So Bernard Wood thinks it's critical not only to find more fossils, but to try and get more information from the fossils we have and to look at them in different ways, to find parts that might give new clues to their place on the tree of life. You can obviously increase the evidence base by finding more fossils, but you can also increase the evidence base by finding out more things about the fossils that you do have. There are methods like CT scanning, there are imaging methods, which are allowing us to collect evidence from fossils that just wasn't accessible before. So, for example, if you take some you know, the work of Brad Spohr, who's been looking at the bony labyrinth, which is the, the, the series of canals in the very hardest part of your head where the inner ear is, he can look at the shape and the proportions of these canals using CT scanning. Now, those canals were always there in those fossils, but they were inaccessible. So, so imaging allows you to increase the evidence base. And as the work goes on, finding and analyzing new evidence and trying to figure out just who's a relative and who's an ancestor, we still need to organize our family tree somehow. When I talk about human evolutionary history, I show the taxa, I show the species that are recognized in the, the fossil record, and I show the earliest fossil evidence at the bottom of the column and the latest fossil evidence at the top of the column. But I never put any, li any lines on the diagram. And that's because, uh, with one or two exceptions, I think we are not really certain whether we have found uh, the ancestors of many of the taxa on that diagram. Those ancestors may be something that hasn't been discovered yet. When I was younger, I used to stress how much I thought we knew. The older I get, I tend to stress how much we don't know. And when you think that the Rift Valley, where all the, you know, the fossil sites, including Olduvai and, and Hadar and the Middle Awash, and all the way down to Malawi, and the fossil sites in southern Africa, and the fossil sites in Chad, if you look at the surface area of Africa that those sites occupy, it's probably less than 4% of the surface area of Africa. And if you think that the good Lord in her wisdom and magnanimity had, um, has made sure that the fossils that we find in the Rift Valley and in the Southern African cave sites capture every little intricacy of, of human evolution, then you're more of an optimist than I am. So I would go for complexity over simplicity and I would go for skepticism about what was ancestral to what, rather than, rather than confidence about what was ancestral to what. What started as a simple little ink sketch in Darwin's notebook has grown to hold the history and relationships of everything that's ever lived, billions of organisms represented in one amazing image. And as we've continued to fill it in over the past 150 years, our little section of the tree is getting more interesting all the time. Human evolutionary history is an area where I think more information might help folks behave better. It might help individuals behave better to realize that every modern human is African, no matter what they look like. They came from Africa. You know, I mean, you know, although some people have have pigmented skin and some people don't have pigmented skin and some people have wiry hair and some people have straight hair, you're probably as, 
is likely to be genetically more different than the person that lives next door to you than you are somebody from the other side of the world. And this sort of information, I think, it would help people make make better decisions. The more we find out about how life is interconnected, the less likely we are to screw the world up. That's my hope. Whether that hope will ever be translated into results, I don't know, but that's my hope. You can hear more from Bernard Wood in his book, Human Evolution, A Very Short Introduction, and on his blog, Sideways Look. We'll have links in the show notes. Origin Stories is a project of the Leakey Foundation. The Leakey Foundation is working to fill in our part of the tree of life by funding research and fieldwork expeditions. You can help support this podcast and the science we talk about. For a limited time, your donation will be doubled by an anonymous supporter. Visit leakeyfoundation.org slash million. That's L-E-A-K-E-Y foundation.org. Transcription services are provided by Adept Word Management, Intelligent Transcripts. Visit them online at adeptwordmanagement.com. Thanks to all of you who've left reviews on iTunes and joined our Facebook group. Good reviews are the best way to help other people find the show, and it means a lot to us. This episode was produced by me, Meredith Johnson. Our editor is Audrey Quinn. Original music and sound engineering by Henry Nagel. The Leaky Foundation logo of the Marching Men is an iconic representation of human evolution. People sometimes ask why it hasn't evolved as more evidence is found. Why it doesn't show more of a bush than a ladder. You can learn more about the history of this logo by visiting our website, leakyfoundation.org. Thanks for listening.